A couple of years ago, I hit quite a significant low point when I realized that I had no idea what to do with my life. I wasn't the most successful student that the University of Stellenbosch ever saw, and after a Many years, many setbacks and many tears in a desperate attempt to find a hope for a future and rekindle a sense of adventure. I bought a plane ticket to Paris and a train ticket to the south of France to go look for a job on a private yacht, which I found. And it was the adventure of a lifetime. So I remember one specific night, we sailed from Italy to Spain across the Gulf of Lyon and we encountered some, some bad weather. Um, the wind blew in really hard from the side, and every time our yacht would go over a wave and crash into the next one, it would creak and roll and just make horrifying sounds. And I was really, really scared. And something special happened a couple of hours into the storm. Um, the moon, I could see the moon just above the horizon, as the clouds sort of lifted. Now, you have to understand that on a yacht at night, in a storm, it's dark. It's, you don't have um, lights like you do on a car. So what happened was, I saw the reflection of the moon directly in front of me, on my heading. And I, I sat there, and I, I remember feeling it was as if the moon was nudging me forward. The reflection laid down a path for me. It was edging me through this storm. And I sat there, and I felt so alive and happy. And this is a feeling that I want everybody to experience. And I call this feeling vocation. And I'm very passionate about this. So today I would like to talk to you about three things I often get asked. What is vocation? Why did I give away almost a thousand cups of coffee in the last year? And then also why I choose to lift the questions in my heart through vocational expeditions in Africa with students, entrepreneurs, and young working individuals. So, let's get started. Picture the following. You are sitting at a coffee shop, and somebody behind you, they're talking really loudly. You're having a nice conversation with your friends, and they start talking really loudly. And, and you get irritated. I would get irritated unless they say something about Ernest Hemingway. <laughs> Adventure. A four by four. Africa, for that matter. And then also Mike Horn, my favorite explorer and mentor. When I hear these words, I want in on that conversation. <laughs> Why? What are they saying? What are they talking about? I want in. When I hear them all in one sentence, I would probably faint. Why is it that I feel an innate sense of belonging when I hear these words? What are the words that will make you turn your head when you are sitting at a coffee shop and somebody is talking really loudly? Those words are the first step for you to understand your vocation. So Aristotle defined vocation as being where your talents and the needs of the world cross. There lies your vocation. Today I want to call it something else. I want to call it where your, and excuse my handwriting, where your deep gladness and the world's deep hunger meet. There lies your vocation. What does this mean? Where your deep gladness and the world's deep hunger meet, that's your vocation. Millennials often get criticized for being self-entitled narcissists. I have no idea why. <laughs> Which means that they either own their own radio... I mean, um, uh, they're either a, a, trust, a trust fund baby that uh, owns his own motorcycle mechanic workshop, classic, or you work for 2,000 rand a month at your local NGO. We want to do good and we want to do well. But why, is this, why does this create a tension? Why is it so difficult for us to understand our vocation in this setting? This means that, if I can quickly illustrate to you, if this is the world's deep hunger, this is the line that represents the world's, world's deep hunger, 
We are either apathetic to what's going on down here. We don't really mind. Or we are so invested in making a difference that we sort of try and track right next to the action, right next to what the world needs, the deep hunger. We track a line. We put ourselves right in there through poverty, education, inequality. And then we get tired, thinking change is just around the corner. Thinking I must just keep going, and then I can make the difference that I was supposed to make. And then we get tired, and we start to suffer from compassion fatigue. Compassion fatigue is real. And we move away from what the world needs, the deep hunger. Now, it's going to sound crazy, but for the next second, I want you to forget about what the world needs. Try it. Forget about what the world needs for the next couple of minutes and put yourself here. The starting point of where your deep gladness lies, the first steps. It's scary, it's alone, it's very uncertain, and it requires an insane amount of courage to start here. Sustainable change doesn't have a corner. It's not around the corner. The way you create sustainable change is by going head on into it, by using your own deep gladness. So, what does this mean exactly? And how do we, how do we find this? Aristotle said, the meaning of life is to find your gift. Sorry, Picasso said that. Let's not get the two confused. The purpose of life is to give it away. The meaning of life is to find your deep gladness. The purpose of life is to give it away. How do we look for it? Where do we start? We start by acknowledging the fact that we live in a society that gives us answers and quick fix answers. We don't know how to ask ourselves the right questions. Let me use an example. The current career guidance system of South Africa. Parents, if you send your children to a psychologist, for example, in school or even in university, you would get an answer. And it's not a big deal. All they have to then do is decide between becoming a doctor, an entrepreneur, or a pilot. And at that stage, it's not as if your life's, you know, pending on this. But it is. It is. And so what I want to try and say is that we should learn how to ask ourselves the right questions. And Rainer Rilke is a poet who said it beautifully. He said, be patient towards all that is unsolved in your heart. And try and love the questions themselves, like locked rooms or like books that are now written in a very foreign tongue. Do not now seek the answers which cannot be given you because you will not be able to live them. And the point is to live everything. Live the questions now, and perhaps gradually, without even noticing it, you will live along some distant day into the answer. I started an organization called An Unraveling Exploration. What we do is we coach, we consult, <coughs> and we adventure. <laughs> so, I often ask my coaches, the people I coach one-on-one, -on -one, school students, university students, entrepreneurs, guys that started to work, what would you do if you knew you could not fail? And this helps me to sort of understand what they're interested in. And then I ask them, what would you still do even if you knew you were going to fail? Yo. Because that helps me understand what they are passionate about, what they will engage in, even if, even if failure is at the end point. Chris Burkard um, takes wonderful photos on Instagram. He said, the, the, the search is the reward. The search is the reward. See, what we have to do is that it's a socially constructed way of thinking of our job. We've got job, career, occupation, and then vocation. And on this side, you have the words that make you turn your head and want to faint. 
You have to merge those two, and it's possible. I believe it's possible. Um, last year, I started, out, I started handing out cups of coffee uh, to people to come and share their ideas with me. Come and tell me, what, what are you passionate about? How can you use your idea to uplift the community? And then I try and connect people together so that we can take those ideas and turn it into reality. What was shocking and really scary was that 95% of the people that came to me voiced their idea for the very first time. Why is it so hard to talk about our deep gladness? Why is it so hard to talk about our innate sense of belonging, what we feel passionate about? Why is it so hard to make the jump from here to the starting point of finding your deep gladness? Ten years ago, I started to facilitate vocational expeditions in Africa. I take students and young entrepreneurs, and we go and visit a friend specifically in northern Mozambique called Francois Rauch. Francois has a way of going into a community and teaching them a way to communicate to each other. In this community, the individuals say this, I need you to need me. I need you to need me. This means that I take the students and we learn innovation in its purest form, in its purest form, where there's empathy. Innovation outside of empathy isn't real. An innovative idea brings forth innovation only when it means that there is behavioral change. Have you noticed that everybody is using the word innovation? Have you noticed this? Everybody is now using the word innovation. Stop using the word innovation if it's not going to bring forth behavioral change. I want you guys to put empathy back in innovation. I want you to start talking about your ideas. I'm still going strong with the, co with the coffees, and you're all, you're, you are all invited. 2,000 years ago, a Greek elder said the following in Latin, Semper aliquid novi Africa ad fere. This means that there is always something new out of Africa. There is always something new out of Africa. I believe this still today because of the empathy that I saw nestled in beautiful communities in Africa. Does this not say something about the spirit and endeavor of this continent? Does this not say something about you? The key to real social innovation and sustainable change is not for you to go look for more answers, but to have the courage to go lift the questions in your heart. Now, isn't that an idea worth spreading? Thank you very much.